well, discombobulated. That's just because we are. It was a good ladies retreat. Yes, yes. Good, uh, good plug for the ladies retreat. It's a yearly. We've got men's prayer advance yearly and ladies retreat yearly. And if you want more pass down, talk to my wife. But it's always been a super edifying, encouraging time for her. She always yeah. comes back recharged and encouraged from the word and from the fellowship and from, from getting away and just spending some time with the Lord, focused time with God. And so definitely a worthy investment. Um, men, we want to take the time, not only make sure that we're taking the time for ourselves to go get plugged in walk with Christ so that we can be the spiritual leader of our homes because we have a thriving, living walk with the Lord. But we also want to prioritize taking the time to get our wives the opportunity to get in the word and recharge and be with Christ because they need that too. We want both mommies and daddies that are overflowing with a vibrant life in Christ. So that's not what I'm sharing about, but it is a good opportunity to put in the plug for that. It's a good one to just put on your schedule. And uh, I mean, my, my encouragement would be that it's not even optional. That's kind of the way we treat it. If at all possible, it's just going to happen. It needs to happen. It's good for us to set aside those times to go seek the Lord. Jesus set that example. He goes away to pray all the time. Okay, so what I would like to talk about today is rooted in the most popular verse in the Bible. Any guesses as to what that is? I don't, I don't have a, stati- a footnote to prove this, but I, I can't imagine that it's any other verse. It's, it's pretty pretty commonly understood. So anybody? John 3.16, that's right. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Something that I have been thinking about for myself is that, is eternal life, eternity. And just how easy it is to not think about eternity, to go day in and day out and get used to the daily grind and get focused on the here and now, the stuff we can see. Now, we're not Gnostics who believe that the stuff we can see is bad and that true spiritual life and victory means that you, you stop caring about the physical world and you just kind of get subsumed into spirituality. Spiritual good, physical bad, that's not biblical. God made the physical world. God is redeeming the physical world. But scriptural, sc- scripture is clear. The physical world is not all that there is. And not only that, but it's not the primary world, if that makes sense. What does scripture tell us to do? Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. What does that mean? Don't love your wife and kids? Of course not. No, but it does mean that as Christians... We have a heavenly focus. Our focus on the things of this world emanates from the deeper reality of who Christ is, of the sovereignty of God, of the promises of God, of our eternal destination, that I am not simply living to reap rewards in this life. I am living to be satisfied in the next. I am living to please and one day to see and enjoy forever Christ. That is the purpose of my life as a Christian. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So I'm glorifying him now, at least that's the goal, and then I'm going to enjoy him forever. And I should be enjoying him now and will be glorifying him forever. This is in stark contrariety to the humanistic, atheistic worldview, which says that you have nothing to look forward to. This is all that there is. Scripture tells us something quite to the contrary. So if Jesus is who he says he is, if Jesus really did rise from the grave and he says, whoever believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life, then is that true? You have to settle that question in your heart. I have to settle that question in my heart because that's foundational. If John 3.16 is true, whoever believes in the Son of God will not perish but will have everlasting life, then that is a truth that should set our frame of reference constantly. That should be glasses through which we are viewing everything. Bad day at work, stressful day at home, 
Upset spouse, kids out of control, burned dinner, tight finances, car breaks down, whatever. And that, that's on the trial side. Then you've got the blessing side, right? Thanksgiving feast, everything's going just the way you hoped, uh, had a great family vacation. All of that is to be interpreted through the reality that I'm living for something even better. I am living for the life to come. That doesn't mean I don't care about this life. It doesn't mean I'm not invested in this life. It means I'm invested in this life as someone who is living for the next. Now, the atheist accuses the Christian of, well, you just believe that because you don't like the concept of death and you need religion as a crutch to help you deal with the concept of death. That is really not an argument. It's just kind of an an attempt at an insult. Like, oh, you're just a backwoods farmer who needs a crutch to get through life and you can't handle the truth. Now, we can argue evidences and all that. I'm not getting into that right now. My only point is, so you're saying that having a worldview that makes sense of life and death is a negative? It's something to be ashamed of? It's a testament to my intellectual inabilities? I'm not ashamed of the fact that as a Christian, I know where I'm going when I die. I'm not ashamed of the fact that I have hope beyond the grave. In fact, that is an argument for the truth of Christianity, not against the truth of Christianity. Every human has an inherent desire for something greater, an inherent desire. I don't want this to just end. I don't want to just kind of make my way through life and then turn into worm food. That's that's lousy. Isn't, is there nothing better? And Jesus comes along and says, yes, there is. Not only that, but I actually went into the grave, defeated death, came back, and I'm telling you that you can join me. Repent, believe, come to Christ, you will have everlasting life. What a promise. Now, if there's no good reason to believe that it's true, then sure, you can make your accusation and say you just need that as a crutch. But that's simply not the case. And we can argue the evidences and argue the presuppositionalism down the road. Just don't let that argument throw you. Oh, you just need a crutch to get through life. Oh, you mean I have answers for the biggest questions in life? Correct. Yes. Yes, I do. And I think the fact that you're satisfied with a worldview that can't answer the biggest questions of life is actually a strike against you, not a strike against me as a Christian. Okay, but I want to hone in on and just remind us about this focus here. We have... There's both the focus on eternity and being reminded that Jesus is our, he's our Lord, our Savior, our Master. We live to please him. So our day-to-day lives are supposed to be yielded with an eternal focus and a daily submission to Christ. Daily walking humbly with our God. That is the Christian walk. That's where we have peace. That's where we have joy when we are seeking to walk humbly with our God. And we're seeing everything with the eternal perspective. That puts our trials in perspective. That puts our joys in perspective. That puts our temptations into perspective. Do I really want to settle for something less? Or am I living for something greater in Christ? Am I living for the eternal? In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. We either believe that or we don't. And belief is not, some, it's not simply mental assent, because the demons also believe and shudder. They know that God is real, etc. They, they probably know scripture as well or better than we do. But that faith is not living faith. They're in rebellion to the truth that they know. But for us, if at the right hand of God there are pleasures forevermore, like really, like actually, fullness of joy which means that nothing that you've experienced in this life comes close to what is promised us in Christ Jesus? If I believe that, how is that going to change the way I live? How is it going to change the way I treat my kids, my wife, how, how I view my work, how I spread the gospel, how I evangelize? Would you like to participate in fullness of joy forever? Because you can. I would like to invite you to an eternal feast. How can I keep that in if I really believe that? How can I just kind of go on as normal? This is stuff we all know, but we have to be reminded because we get used to it. We get dead to it, and we don't want to. 
We need to not. We need to be shaken up and reminded of the goodness that is ours in Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I heard a quote recently. I think it was. I don't remember. I don't remember who said it. But it was something about if you, if there's a cup and it's full of, of bitter, nasty water and you bump the cup, what spills out? Bitter, nasty water, right? And if there's a cup that is brimful of of something delicious, something sweet, and you bump it, what spills out is that which is sweet and delicious. And that being an analogy for us, we are all, (coughs) excuse me, vessels walking around in this world and constantly getting bumped. We're getting bumped by a grumpy spouse. We're getting bumped by impatient children. We're getting bumped by the annoying coworker. We're getting bumped by fill in the blank. Okay, so when we get bumped, what spills out? That's when our our faith is put to the test. So if my faith, if the focus of my heart, right, set your affections on things above, am I actively setting my affections on things above or is my mind just naturally getting stuck in the things of the earth? It's easy to do. The Bible gave us that exhortation because we needed that exhortation. The stuff that's in front of us is so easy to focus on. And so if my, my affections are tied up in the things of this earth, it's really, really easy to get upset. It's really, really easy to get bumped and to spill out a little bit of bitterness, a little bit of anger, a little bit of snippiness, whatever. Because I'm already tied up in the things of this world and now somebody burned my pizza. Well, that was the highlight of my week. You just ruined my week. And there goes my joy. There goes my love. Because why? Because my affections are wrong. Now, is it it wrong to want good pizza over burned pizza? Of course not. That's where we get back to we're not Gnostics. We're not saying the physical world doesn't matter. It does matter, but it matters in a secondary sense. It matters as a, this is where we're walking out the eternal truth of the love of God the Father for me. Of the rewards that I have in Christ. Of the fact that I am now not condemned. I am on my way to eternal joy. And therefore, I live as a Christian, by faith. So when you bump me, you're going to run into somebody who is overflowing with excitement about eternity, about the work of God, about the love of God, because that's where my affections are. That's where my mind is set. That's what is rolling around in my head is who Jesus is and who I am in Christ. And then you're going to run into me and I'm going to spill out a little bit of guess who Jesus is. That's what's going to spill out, right? The grace of God, the love of God, the joy that I have in Christ. That's what I want. (laughs) Not saying that that's what's always the case, but that is what I want. That's what we should all want. So that is my question for all of us. And so we go into Independence Day and and we're Americans. We're proud Americans. We should be. We have a great heritage. We're very blessed. So again... We're not Gnostics who act like politics and nations and all that stuff doesn't matter. No, those are all theaters. They're all arenas in which biblical truth will either be obeyed or rejected. And as Christians, we want to speak the truth, speak the truth of God's word in every area, family, church, state, economy, wherever you go. But we're not primarily Americans. We're primarily Christians. So we deal with America, we celebrate America, we remember our American heritage, and we do it all as citizens of a higher kingdom, which cannot be shaken. So America may come and America may go, and I hope and pray that America remains and repents and comes to Christ and is forgiven. But I pray all of those things as someone who's primarily a citizen of heaven, as someone whose affections are, or at least should be, tied up in Christ. And so I do all that I do, I speak to all that I speak to, I influence the real, not real, because both worlds are real. I influence the concrete, the here and now world as someone whose affections are tied up in the life to come. That is a sweet promise of Christ. John 3.16, we hear over and over and over again and get so used to it. But it would be worth meditating on. It would be worth walking around singing Jesus loves me a little more. Because it's true. 
And that's something we need to and we're called to live with at the forefront of our minds. Jesus loves me. I believe in him, which means I will not perish, but will have everlasting life. I could do with thinking about that more and thinking about the worries and the stresses and this and that a lot less. So let's set our perspective on the promises of Christ, what is true in him, the rewards that he has promised, the fullness of joy that we look forward to. And let us be free of the shackles of the here and now. Instead, be free to invest in the here and now with an eye to eternity.